Chaudhry eh, actualmente es un director independiente en ejecutivo en el comité de dirección de Recognize Bank en Londres y en el comité de Luxe Group Building Society. Ha ejercido de tesorero en, en Royal Bank of Scotland, Europe Arab Bank y en KBC. Actualmente es miembro de GARP, Chartered Institute for Security Investment, London Institute of Banking, of Banking and Finance. Además es fundador de BTRM y escritor de varios libros como The Principal Banking. ¿no? Eh, para nosotros es un gran honor contar con él. La verdad es que al final es, un, es un, una opinión diferente ¿no? desde el mundo anglosajón. Eh, que creemos que, que, que añadía valor a los ponentes que teníamos. Entonces, bueno, sin más dilación, le vamos a dar acceso y empezamos su ponencia. Hello, Murat. Can you hear me? Hello, I can. Yes. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much and welcome uh, to our forum. Uh, for us, it's a real pleasure to have you here. And I already did the proper introduction uh, in Spanish, obviously. I, I promise that it was right. <laughs> I, I think yes, thank you very much. <laughs> and yes, it's all yours. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you much for the introduction. Uh, it was indeed in Spanish, but I, I am sure that it was all uh, all in order. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to present. Thank you to yourself and to Mirai uh, to, to, for inviting me to present at your event this afternoon. We're going to talk about, as, uh, as, uh, as Mr. Vasquez just introduced, about the impact on Treasury and ALM since the onset of the COVID-19 stress event, which is ongoing, by the way. So this is a dynamic situation. So what I'd like to do is uh, share the screen and my slides. I hope that is in order. I hope you can still see and hear me while I move the slides into presentation mode. Okay, there we go. And uh, and there we are. That That's the presentation for this afternoon. And once again, my thanks to the organizers for inviting me to present at this event. I should say that I first presented something like this simply by posting on social media back in March, at the, in the last week of March, after here in the UK, when we had the imposition of lockdown. I was asked by more than one uh, bank practitioner within the Treasury and asset liability management space, what does this mean, if anything, for Treasury and the ALM discipline within a bank? And back in March, I feared the worst. I, I thought it was going to be quite a serious market-wide event in terms of and in, impacting uh, at, uh, at, the, at the aggregate level, banks, balance sheet, risk management, and also access to funding. It hasn't turned out like that, but much of what I'm, well, some of what I'm about to present would have been very relevant back in March and April, but since then we can modify it. So I'm going to represent some of that material in the presentation, but also bring us up to date and perhaps think of some conclusions going forward in the medium term. And we'll also, this means for our stress testing processes next year. If you are involved at, at your institution's ICAP, capital adequacy, and ILAP, liquidity adequacy processes, and indeed your recovery planning, there are quite a number of lessons learned to take away from what we've observed this year so far that we can feed into our stress testing processes for next year. And I, I will round off the presentation with a few words on that at the end. So here is our agenda. The appendix at the end, I will not go through. That's simply there for your reference, but I will uh, introduce first the current environment, look back at March and April, what's happened since then. Specifically, we want to look in a bit more detail at the role of ALCO and the impact on balance sheet risk for us as a result of this ongoing stress event. And then I present a sort of checklist of action points. As I said at the start, some of these points would have been very pertinent back in March and April, but maybe not so much now because we've seen how the stress has played out. Of course, we're still in this crisis, so it's still ongoing. Here in the UK, I'm still in lockdown. The UK is still in a national lockdown, a so-called second wave response. So we're still playing, the crisis is still playing out. So there are lessons to be learned from the first part of it, but also going forward. And the implications for next year have still not been completed. So really it's, a, it's, it's important to remember this is a dynamic situation and the best run banks are demonstrating two things. They're demonstrating an adaptability 
and speed of response. Uh, an ability to respond quickly to customers, but also to adapt one's ALM processes and risk management framework and risk appetite framework where that's deemed necessary. And the banks that are slower to do this will be impacted, well, potentially negatively in the future once we are through the crisis. First of all, what is it we're talking about, of course, the global pandemic, uh, first noted around December, January time in Asia and East Asia, uh, here in Europe, and indeed globally after that, from March onwards, countries implemented various forms of so-called lockdown, which has had a severe negative impact on economic output as we all stay at home and, and self-isolate, so to speak. Uh, and so this, uh, and this resulted in subsequent central government and central bank response. But at the same time, it also asked us as treasury and ALM people to address the issues for our own particular balance sheet. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the remainder of this presentation. We should also remember that this time round, compared to 2008 and 2009, this isn't a existential crisis for banks. Banks aren't part of the problem this time round, but uh, ideally they can be part of the solution. And we'll also look at that during the course of the presentation. So what was the initial market impact? The initial market impact was deemed to be potentially quite disastrous. I saw a McKinsey report dated in March this year that spoke of up to a 40% decline in LCR and uh, other capital impacts due to their uh, surmised effects of the market crash. This was before any of the regulators had responded. March is before the regulators had responded in resp to, to give guidance on how banks should use their balance sheet resources. So the, the prognosis back in March was not good. And we did see some widening out of, for example, a key market indicator, the three month LIBOR and overnight index swap spread or overnight rate spread. Uh, that has since come in. But to back in March and April, if you'd said to me, what do you think is going to happen? I would have said, let's, uh, we have an English expression, let's batten down the hatches. Let's uh, preserve our balance sheet resources and fear the worst. It hasn't turned out that way. And I'm going to give some suggestions as to why that has been the case. Now, before, first of all, the market impact originally was quite severe. There was a demand on both sides of the balance sheet as both individuals and corporations wanted to hoard cash or stockpile cash, whether electronically or physical. Um, I imagine it's mostly electronic. And that, in, and also at the same time, corp, small corporate entities started drawing down on liquidity lines and overdrafts. So there was a double, there was an impact on both sides of the balance sheet as uh, companies started to withdraw deposits, smaller companies and retail consumers, but also to draw down on funding facilities and overdraft facilities. So that had an impact on, on our balance sheet. I've just given some extracts there from from JP Morgan Interest Rates Research Desk in July this year. It's quite an interesting read, actually. The other interesting read from the same research is wrong way risk, whereby, and I've got some detailed text there. I am assuming that the slides have been made available to you. I'm not going to read out that text. It's a very busy slide. But in essence, banks were seeing a worsening of their liquidity coverage ratio of, because of impacts on both sides of the balance sheet, but also their leverage ratio because their capital requirement was increasing as retail and small corporate consumers started to increase their borrowing, mainly small corporates rather than retail, I should say. So that's this expression, double whammy that we have in the, in, in the English, uh, or we may choose to call it wrong way risk. Again, the impact on both sides of the balance sheet, the, the liquidity coverage ratio worsens, so we need to address it and increase our stock of liquid assets. Um, but at the same time, we are seeing a uh, worsening of leverage as more capital requires to be uh, committed or deployed to meet increased customer demand. So that was something that uh, is a lesson learned going forward. I think there's something to draw from that for the, few, for, the for the immediate future, but not for today as we look to manage the balance sheet through this crisis. Here's another chart from the very same research. Uh, the author has called this a catch-22. My expression was a double whammy, leverage increasing at the same time as the HQLA was. Now, this was observed quite early on, March, beginning of April, which is why we then saw fairly rapid response from both central banks and regulatory authorities. And it's the new normal to me, the way I see it, the new normal is very large, extensive public sector support of the private sector. Uh, for example, here in the UK, we've had this thing called the furlough scheme. It's a mechanism whereby companies are paid by the government 
to retain employees on the payroll and their, some of their salary is paid rather than make them redundant. In Europe, that's had various manifestations. In the US, there have been direct cash transfers, so it, not via the employer, if you like, from the federal government to, to households. So it would appear that the public sector support is here to stay. So the new normal is, is, a, very, is a very large widening out of the, of the public sector um, asset base, if you like, and liability, the tax base. So uh, market impact was just this, the, the impact on our, on, our, on, our, on our metrics. And from an ALM and Treasury perspective, we saw, as I've said earlier, short, a spike in short-term funding rates. That has since come down. Uh, mark collateral requirements increasing. That's the third bullet point there. And also variation margin as derivatives mark to market worsened. There was, there was also an increase in drawdown of, liability, of liquidity lines, as I mentioned earlier, all impacting both sides of the balance sheet. From a market-wide point of view, this is stabilized in most economies because of central bank action, but it also dictated the response of the ALM and Treasury function that I'm going to elaborate uh, in, in, a, in a few slides hence. Here's a summary, slide nine is a summary of some, some aspects, simple, some aspects only of the economic policy response across the countries from, from central government and the central banks. It's taken it's in various forms. I've mentioned the support from central government for the economy in the UK and European Union. Uh, I've mentioned some examples from the USA. We've seen various manifestations of this in, in Asia and the Middle East as well. But really, things started getting interesting, more interesting for us as bankers, as Treasury and ALM people, once we started seeing the response of the regulatory authorities. So the first to kick off. Uh, and unsurprisingly, as it is the, the, the institution that gives guidance for regulatory authorities to follow, quite early on, 3rd of April, I was pers personally speaking, I was actually quite surprised at such a swift response, but perhaps I shouldn't have been. Uh, they had a press statement, in essence, saying that banks were encouraged to support their customer franchise. And critically speaking, for me as an ALM manager, if I was an ALM manager, the Basel Committee made clear that cap balance sheet resources, both capital and liquidity, were there to be used. They were there to be dipped into if necessary as the bank sought to support their customer franchise. And also to apply some flexibility to credit risk treatment, credit exposure treatment of loans, for example, where customers have asked for payment holidays. Now, the text on the left-hand side is a direct quote from the BIS, from the Basel Committee's press statement. The text on the right-hand side is my own interpretation of it. This statement was significant, and now it's been in place for approaching nearly eight months now. Uh, it shows that if a bank feels it needs to dip into balance sheet resources, dipping below previously expected minimum regulator guidance, that's not a problem. Not in the first instance, as long as one informs one's supervisor or regulator and gives a restoration plan, which may well have two, one or two years on it, then that's okay. So I took this away as very significant guidance, dipping into capital buffers, including pillar 2B and pillar 2A, and liquidity buffers, including the 100% minimum for liquidity coverage ratio, was not going to get the bank in trouble. In fact, if it wasn't necessarily positively encouraged, it was expected as, a banks, as banks responded to their customers' requirements. Just by way of example, I've just highlighted the UK regulator response, but if you look, you'll see that there's been responses from the European Central Bank, the European Banking Authority, the US Federal Reserve. And following the cue or the direction given by the Basel Committee on the 3rd of April, regulators around the world have published more or less similar sorts of documents. I want to highlight, as I introduce on slide 11, here you go, <laughs> extracted specifically those two paragraphs on page two and page five of a UK regulator, the PRA, the Prudential Regulator Authority, a UK regulator's publication on the 20th of April, so about three odd weeks, uh, three, just under three weeks after the BIS had given its guidance, which in essence says liquidity buffers are there to be used and capital buffers are there to be used. How one interprets those statements um, is interesting. And I think for every bank, this is a discussion at ALCO. The Asset Liability Committee at every bank should be taking these documents away and interpreting them uh, and, and coming up to their own conclusions. Because if you were to ask me, what does it mean capital buffers are there to be used? Well, to me, the capital buffer is everything from pillar one all the way to pillar 2B. So in theory, they're all available. Now, as I did say at the start, some of what I'm saying would have been past checklist actions. This would have been something that I would have expected an ALCO to do uh, 
uh, back in April. So I'm assuming that every bank has addressed this now and, and applied its interpretation of these sorts of statements. But very interesting, it helps to inform us what we can do, what the bank can do to support its customers. And this is very, very useful. And in fact, it's vital from a board perspective. The Asset Liability Committee should be recommending for board approval its view on what this sort of guidance means. In other words, we have this much capital and this much liquidity and we can make use of it uh, as we seek to support the customer franchise. And if as a result of uh, defaults and increasing unemployment and, and higher provisioning, we are eating into our capital buffers or as a result and or as a result of increased withdrawal of deposits or, uh, or, some, or, or shortage of funding, we are dipping into our liquidity buffers. If they're dipping below regulatory minimums, that's not an issue. We inform the supervisor and we prepare a restoration plan. But other than that, we carry on. So this is not the significant impact that it would have been if this had been a firm specific event. Because it's market wide, there is much more flexibility. That's my interpretation. So as a result of this, how, what should we have been doing? Think of this as a, as a review. Think of this, the next few slides as a review of what uh, banks should have been expected to do from April onwards this year. Managing the balance sheet response. In the first instance, we'll need to review what this means for our credit, our, our, our credit uh, risk exposure our, uh, and our approach to credit. The, I have seen quite a significant variation in response from banks uh, here in the UK and in Europe as well. And, and interestingly enough, in, in, in Asia, and the Middle East, I've seen a variation in response from banks to this stress event since March, April this year, with some banks have maintained doing new business for new customers. And at the other end of the spectrum, I'm aware of one or two banks, at least, that have stopped doing new business of any kind for any customer. So there's, that's quite a wide variation. How can we answer that question? What's the best way as ALM people? How should we recommend something to the boards to assess? Well, one of the ways I think was very useful, and I've been saying this since March, is what I've circled there in red on that slide. The question to answer is, how much resource do we actually have available? In other words, how much capital and how much liquidity can we reasonably seek to deploy during what is an ongoing stress event? I mean, it could go much worse. This could be much worse than it's played out. We don't know what the final outcome is going to be. So how much resources should we sensibly deploy before we think, no, we need to preserve the rest in case it, it, the stress gets worse and we need to maintain the viability of the balance sheet? So what I was suggesting from March on was this year was actually apply something that you would normally only do once a year in your ICAP because it's a Basel three requirement. In fact, I think it's a Basel II requirement, uh, a Basel requirement to undertake a reverse stress test in your capital adequacy and your liquidity adequacy processes. Most banks, if not all banks, would have been doing this once a year. But actually, let's, let's apply a reverse stress test. Why? Because we want to work backwards from our, our reverse stress test. That's the scenario that breaks the bank. The bank can't survive. Work backwards, make it successively and iteratively less severe until we get to the point where under a severe scenario, the bank still survives. Because at that point, you could conclude that this is how much resource we have available. So we undertake a reverse stress test. Okay, under this scenario, the bank won't survive. We make it successively less severe. And at the point where we think, yes, even if all of this was to happen, it's still severe, the bank will have sufficient capital and liquidity to be viable as a going concern. So the difference between that number and what you have today above that is available to deploy. You could conceivably use all of that to support cap a more lending and supporting customers from a liquidity point of view. And if all of that was erased, uh, eroded, you would still be viable. So I think this is a very useful tool to help answer the question, to inform the board how much of the balance sheet should we use and you know have exposure to and deploy, how much capital resource and liquidity resource should we deploy, and we'll still be okay if all of it got wiped out. That's a quantitative analysis. And I think the board will be in a much better position to decide its strategy to address this crisis, what they should, the bank should be doing in this crisis, if they have the answer to that question. So that's something that I was suggesting back in March. If it hasn't been done yet, certainly it's still worth doing. And who should be running all of this process? In my, in my personal opinion, this is first and foremost an Asset and Liability Committee own. The Asset and Liability Committee has a vital function a two-way, both upwards and downwards during this crisis and beyond, as it seeks to steer the bank to support the customer, but also remain viable. Okay, so what is this two-way direction? First of all, the ALCO, I would suggest, has a role to give direction to the 
the customer facing business lines, the relationship managers, RM, relationship managers, the people who deal with the customer, who the customer is in contact with to ask for support, whether it's on loans or funding or withdrawal of deposits or funding solutions. So the direction to come to the RMs from Alco is yes, we can, we can, we can uh, ease the risk appetite this much. We can take on more risk in this space, or we can deploy this much capital. You can do this much more lending. You can approve this much more extensions of overdrafts. So that's the role of the Alco, but it's also upwards. The role of the Alco is to recommend for board approval, anything that requires board approval. For example, uh, uh, applying or implementing specific management actions in response to a stress. It could have been a, a withdrawal of deposits that was above normal. Uh, temporarily making changes to the risk appetite limit that's in place currently. So for example, up until now, our concentration limit for this has been X, but because of a severe impact on this sector, because of lockdown, we need to increase that concentration to support our customers. Well, I say we need to. You may not need to, but that's a strategic decision. That's a customer stakeholder decision that the board would take. How much support should we give to the sector? If that means making a temporary change to the risk limits, then so be it. The ALCO should do the analysis and it would recommend it for board approval and the board's either going to approve it or not. So ALCO has a very vital role in managing the balance sheet during this crisis and beyond. And if that means holding daily meetings, extraordinary meetings outside of the monthly meetings, then 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 that that that's perfectly fine uh, back in march and april i was noting every other day meetings of the alco or in some cases the exco by banks uh, in, in in a number of countries including the uk because the the, the crisis was just beginning that we 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 was unsure as to how severe it's going to be and at the same time the alco is going to have an idea of how much liquidity resources available how much capital is the buffers it can make so again it's going to it's going to to recommend anything is necessary for board approval if any changes are being made or if, if if appetite is being increased or capital is being utilized in a way that might not have been expected previously or before the crash it's a very important role of the alco in managing the balance sheet and in that respect something i said back in march but i reiterate the immediate term response would have been something that i'm i'm fairly certain banks would have um covered off back in march and april but there are still some um, and indeed the short term actions as well. There's still some medium term actions that I think the ALCO needs to be taking both now and also when the crisis is played out. Let's assume for the sake of argument that uh, in most countries around the world, things will be more or less back to normal, <laughs> whatever that normal might be, say by, by summer, say by June. OK, in which case we've got some lessons learned to take away. ALCO should take away some lessons learned. For example, how did the risk management framework respond during this crisis? How adapt? was it? How did our model governance work? Model risk is something uh, that I've also pre been presenting on recently because during a stress event, model output, models output starts to become unreliable because the patterns of data starts hitting outliers. So you and one has to start dealing with broken models. So how did our model governance and our model risk perform? How is our ability to amend risk appetite limits if we thought necessary? How, how adaptable and how quick was that? How was our data analytics capability? If you have an accurate picture of your balance sheet exposure as customers respond on a daily basis, and it is genuinely accurate and up to date, you're in a much better position to take response uh, action in response and manage the balance sheet than if you have uncertainty about your data. So the data analytics capability is another lesson learned. If we don't think it was fit for purpose, that's a priority item for now going forward. So there are a number of action points that Alco should have been or, and should still be addressing and overseeing in the immediate response in the short term and the medium term. And what I've got now is a list of management actions that I first presented back in March. So this is what I mean about a review of what I would have suggested at the start of this crisis. I like to think that most of these items on the checklist have been covered off because they would have been on our radar or they should have been on our radar back in March and April. So let's see what, what I was suggesting then. So this is a reprise. The slides at the beginning, at the end of this presentation are more or less new. They're reasonably recent, but the slides in the middle of this presentation, principally the ones in these sets of boxes are the old ones from March. Let's see if they're still relevant. First of all, in an area of, in an, in an, in an environment of uncertainty, we don't know uh, what the liquidity position is going to look like. And back in March, as one observed, the three month LIBOR spread over overnight widening out. We were potentially worried about a freeze in money markets and FX markets. 
that wouldn't have, would would have been a reasonable response. Of course, now we realise it didn't get anything like that, so we can possibly relax a bit. But originally, the recommendation would have been optimise the cash position, where you have a liquid asset buffer, your HQLA held in non-cash form, then perhaps transform some of that to assets that are either instantly liquid, like government T-bills, or cash. In the eurozone, that's a particular issue because of the negative drag on the HQLA. But in any case, those banks have been managing that for the last six years anyway, so that would have been nothing new. So first of all, maximize or optimize the cash position because we're unaware of the impact on liquidity. And as the crisis goes on, perhaps we can relax some of that. Again, I saw some bond market bid offer spreads in the euro bond market widen out through March and April, but that hasn't followed on. It hasn't been a severe impact. Customer deposits. Now that, as we, as we may have expected, this crisis wasn't going to be a quick one. This wasn't going to be a 30-day liquidity stress <laughs> like LCR. Uh, in fact, it wasn't going to be a 90-day or a pillar two liquidity stress. This crisis has been going on since March, eight or nine months now. So during that time, we still want to maintain as much as possible. And this is an ALCO view, by the way, for board recommendation. We want to maintain customer business as much as possible. That means bringing on new customer deposit levels. So still maintain proactive marketing to optimize the customer deposit base rather than dip back from it, step back from it. What else on the customer franchise? Very important to monitor the response of the customers. And while that may have eased up in recent months, back in March and April, it was quite, um, it was akin to panic buying in the supermarkets. I don't know how many of you listening today uh, are in jurisdictions where there was panic buying in the supermarkets, but here in the UK, back in March and April, and all the way till the summer, we observed empty shelves for, for an interesting range of products, by the way. I don't need to go into them right now, but you'd be surprised, well, I was, as the range of products that seemed to disappear from the shelves that were being stockpiled. So in the same way, in the, analogous to that, we want to monitor customer behavior on both sides of the balance sheet um, and so that we can we can get as much early warning as possible if anything is going to enter a distressed territory, whether it's excessive use on the asset side, drawing down loans and liquidity lines, or on the deposit side, higher outflows. Interesting statistic that you may uh, uh, you may find um, paradoxical here in the UK. Uh, what from what I had observed, uh, the newer banks saw a, a reduction in their deposit gathering, whereas the traditional high street banks saw an increase. It's almost as if customers during an onset of a stress event prefer traditional banks with branches on the high street rather than the digital ones. But that was a temporary phenomenon which has since abated. Central bank, we should be aware of the central bank measures of support that were introduced and in a number of countries around the world beyond existing central bank liquidity facilities, a number of institutions always introduced new plans and facilities to support to ensure that liquidity was available to all banks. So again, an early checklist item would have been make sure we we, we, we are aware of what's available and make use of it if we need to. Balance sheet risk, again, something that was vitally important to check off back in March and April was, do we have any sort of reliance on the foreign exchange markets? Not an issue for an institution that only funds in its own currency, but of course, if you have a multi-currency balance sheet and critically, one is funding foreign currency denominated loans, not through an organic deposit base in that currency, but by using the foreign exchange markets to take home country deposits and FX them into the loans of a different currency, a reliance on the wholesale FX markets was an area, a stress point, potential stress point at the start of this crisis. So again, mitigate that, see what sources of, of funding are available, make use of them so one doesn't lose them, and then see what, and then to make, sure, make sure one understands what the response would be if there was a freeze in the FX market, because the last thing you want is to fall over in your foreign, the funding of your foreign currency loans. So that was a critical uh, stress point back in March and April that needed addressing and mitigating. I don't, interest rate risk in the banking book, I put it there in the checklist, but I don't see that as any kind of significant balance sheet risk in the current environment. Interest rates are very stable. I don't see them moving at all for at least a couple of years. Uh, that's, a, that, that's a personal prediction. So it's not an issue as such. Uh, and in fact, as a ICAP item, capital adequacy process item, it's sort of on the back burner now. Uh, last year, from the, the EBA's, the European Banking Authority's report on this subject in 2018 said that from the summer of last year, it would be an uh, important part, segment of the ICAP in every bank, even the smaller banks. But it, it would appear to me that it's been put on the back burner 
uh, while we work through this crisis. Collateral management, I quoted from the earlier slide about the initial impact on the markets. Bank, uh, many banks saw an increase in their collateral funding requirement, mainly but not wholly driven by negative impact on mark to market of their derivative positions. So again, something to check very early on was what's our exposure to our collateral funding requirements. Should we let's stress test that and see what it might get up to and make sure we have available funding sources or collateral sources if that does increase. So again, something to check off on one's, one's, on one's uh, action list. Data analytics, always very important, but especially so in the current environment to make sure we know exactly what the balance sheet position is. So, and then address that accordingly. So we're, we're not going to be able to, a board or an asset liability committee is not going to be able to make decisions in the most optimum manner if it doesn't have all the right data. So what is our true balance sheet position? Does it reflect the impact of customer behavior all the way up until yesterday? Is everyone operating off the same data sources? I can't stress how important this is in today's, it's always been important, but it's, it seems to have been a nice to have rather than a vital. I think in, the, in today's environment, if everyone is working off the same data source and ideally the same integrated model, you're going to get a much more efficient conversation at ALCO and at the board. So all lines of defense and all departments, who, which, whichever use they make of, of, of their model output, of their, their analytical, analytical output, same data source and integrated model would be ideal. It's by no means universal in every bank, but I, I do think this crisis has raised that in the order of priorities for what a bank should be addressing post this crash. And my transparency, again, we want to understand what our customers are doing on as regular a basis and as accurate a basis as possible. And if not, how can we make this a capability for us? So I summarize that and some more in a short term balance sheet risk checklist. Again, to reiterate, that would have been something to look at back in March and April. And if we haven't covered these off already, we certainly should be by now. I've talked about how our collateral funding requirements, the impact on what's on which financial statements, whether it's liquidity and PL or both, or liquidity and capital and PL or all three, customer impacts, um, the 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 impacts on our liquidity metrics, the, the response of customers, what customer behavior means for our liquidity and capital benefits, uh, sorry, metrics, liquidity and capital metrics, uh, customer deposit levels. On the right hand side, wholesale funding. Have we seen any drop off in our ability to source wholesale funding? If a bank was not a user of that in the past, there's less of an issue. But if it was, what's the impact on us there? I mentioned derivatives, uh, mark to market of derivatives reading and resulting in increased collateral funding requirement. So that's something to check our exposure to. And equally also illiquidity in money markets and FX markets. Now this checklist you can see here is instantly dated. This would have been something I published in March and you look at all that now and think, hmm, I think possibly you were a bit more worried than you needed to be, Morad, because we didn't get a freeze in the wholesale markets and we didn't get a freeze in FX markets. And, um, and uh, well, as a result, we can carry on more or less on a BAU basis. It's the customer side that has impacted us more than the wholesale market side, which is absolutely correct from what I observe in most jurisdictions around the world. But of course, we can say that now on the 24th of November. On the 24th of March or April, it was less clear. Finally, something on the bottom right hand side, nothing new for the Eurozone or indeed for Japan. But uh, outside of the Eurozone here in the UK, there was a time possibly in the US, there was a concern that uh, central banks might pull the ultimate trigger of going into negative base rates territory, something that the European Central Bank has been doing for the last six years now. And so I think it was important for ALCOs to address what this meant. Here in the UK, that became pertinent because even though base rates dropped down to just above zero at 10 basis points, the government bond curve went negative. So in reality, from, from a HQLA perspective, from a liquid asset buffer perspective, the bank was, banks were already in a negative rates environment. So I think it's very important for Alco to address what this means for the bank's policy, its risk management policy, its liquid asset buffer policy as well, and then customer policy if you're going to change your prices. And I think this should have been a debate back in April in, Alco, in, in Alco, but also now, now that we've come, we've moved down the time, we're eight months into the crisis, do we still need to review this? The HQLA point is very important. In just about any bank in the world, the liquid asset buffer, the high quality liquid asset portfolio, uh, is a negative drag on the balance sheet. So ideally, we want to have it as, as big as it needs to be, but no bigger. 
what this crisis has shown is the need for proactive management of the HQLA, not only to look at what its minimum size needs to be, which is a liquid LCR driven number plus any pillar two liquidity number. It's also we should look at what our maximum size should be. What can we do to what how what process should we follow to put a cap on the size of our liquid asset buffer so that anything beyond that is surplus liquidity that we must deploy, whether it's in a bond portfolio, investment grade rated or otherwise, or increased customer lending, which of course impacts capital, or a combination of the two, we should certainly address it. And I think Alco every six months at least should be reviewing its HQLA policy to look to optimize it. It's very important in the during the current of crisis that, that I, my conclusion is we optimize the HQLA by, ha by having it no bigger than it needs to be. Any bigger that bigger than that, and you are putting considerable negative drag on the balance sheet. Okay, and that's pretty much what I'm saying on that slide there. But this one there isn't my own. I've borrowed this from my close friend Michael Icorn, <laughs> who's a very senior at Credit Suisse. So uh, I'm happy to quote him here on this slide. I have actually edited it very slightly. Um, first of all, on the left hand side, we should deploy our liquidity resources as necessary. Absolutely. Um, and we should review how much above the regulatory minimum we want to hold under a business as usual environment. If you'd asked me this a year ago, I would have said, ah, oh, well, you need to look at the volatility on your LCR, look at your expected business and put 20% on top of that. So if your minimum LCR from the regulator was 100%, which it is, your minimum may be 140 and then your minimum above that for BAU could be 160 or 180. So do you see what banks have been doing? And I myself have been uh, uh, suggesting in my writing as well, putting buffers on top of buffers, surplus, surplus is how I would explain it. The your my minimum buffer above the minimum regulatory capital, my minimum buffer above my minimum LCR. So surplus, surplus has been building up. But as I showed earlier in the slides on regulatory response to this crisis, if we would be expected and not stigmatized for dipping into these buffers during a stress event then perhaps I don't need quite so much surplus surplus. And my minimum for an operating basis can be afford to be just above the regulator's minimum, because if I do dip into it for a stress related reason, there is no stigma associated with that. So this is a live and present conversation. So here, this slide here uh, is a new one. It's Michael's, but it's a new one compared to some of the slides I've been showing. As we come towards this, the, the end game of this stress event, we look at next summer, for example, or the end of this year and the first quarter of next year, one of the lessons learned is what does it mean for our risk appetite statement and our risk limits? The ALM function and ALCO should be reviewing that and recommending its opinion for board approval. Um, if you look on the right hand side, of course, as long as we keep the regulator, the supervisor informed of our intentions, that's fine. And that's perfectly, that's perfectly good practice. And we, we may want to look at the impact of uh, our response to customers as well to drive what this means for our buffers. You know, we may have a more lenient forbearance policy or customer support policy than another institution. So we should consider what this means for our uh, buffers, including our liquidity buffers, but also our capital buffers. I said at the start the importance of supporting the customer franchise. And I did also say at the start that I've seen different banks respond to this in different ways, not vastly different ways. But there has been some significant difference. If I give you a personal example from the UK, but I'm sure you've observed this in your own jurisdiction, there will be some banks that have carried on doing business, including new business for new customers. And there are some banks that have wound down any new business, even for existing customers. And there's some banks in the middle of that. So this, this all speaks to the, the objective of supporting the customer franchise. And again, this I think is something that Alco should be addressing and recommending for board approval because it's not a universal thought. There's more than one way to answer the question, to what extent, how much do we want to support all our existing customers and indeed any new customers that come along? Okay, here in the UK and in a number of other countries, the European Union, the, set, the government introduced a guaranteed loan scheme for customers. So the, the loan from customers, especially SME small corporate customers, was government guaranteed. So there's no capital risk for the bank up beyond a certain haircut, but the loan would still be applied through the customer's bank. And for cut for banks that uh, for, for, for small corporates that wanted to take this loan out, but didn't have uh, an existing loan facility, 
they would go to their bank and find that some banks weren't doing this and applied for the scheme. They would go to a new bank and they would find that in order to draw this loan down, they would need to open a, a, a current account, you know, an operational deposit account first. And for banks that had stopped doing this, these loans are no longer available. So the decision to the decision, the answer to the question, to what extent do we want to support the customer franchise? That's an Alco conversation. Indeed, it's a board approval conversation. Do we want to carry on as we are? Or do we want to wind it down, roll it back, not do any new business with new customers, just seek to support existing ones or something in between? What what should it be? So again, that's an action point for Alco. And I think that, and this is something I was saying back at the start of this crisis, but it's an ongoing one. We should keep updating our approval or recommendations to the board. If you look at the last three bullet points, clear and transparent communication, I think is very important. Again, I've observed some banks taking out full page adverts in the newspapers, the traditional media, as opposed to social media, but also on social media, saying, here is how we support the, the customer. Here's, we are available. Here, here is how you contact us. I've seen other banks notable for their silence. They have, I've not seen any great profile from them. Who's making that decision? To what extent should we, should be, should we be entering into clear and transparent communication with our, with our customers, or indeed with the market as a whole? So I think that's also an Alco action point. You, you could say, well, should that not be Exco? Um, which is a fair question to ask, actually. But I think because the response to customers is so dependent on what resources you've got, the bank has got to support the customers, capital and liquidity, I think it's the conversation is at Alco. But that, I suppose that's a, a debatable point. The other point of communication is up keeping the regulator well, update, well up to date on what the bank is doing, what its plans are, how it's supporting customers, and what impacts there have been on the balance sheet. Additional action points, more medium term, but I've written there short term. Your current liability strategy may have had to be modified because what you signed off this time last year as your funding strategy for 2020 may well have been unachievable. Depends on what customers' uh, response is. So update the current funding plan and then update for the rolling funding plan as well. Always seek to remain within your recovery plan appetite levels, unless you want to change your risk appetite, because of course, we don't want to be triggering a recovery plan. Again, something for Alco to keep a point on or keep an eye on. There's also a text. I always recommend that um, it, banks of a certain size, for the sake of argument, let's say a balance sheet of above $5 billion, but that's debatable. For banks of a certain size, I always think there's some value in having, in having, um, uh, a technical ALCO subcommittee, let's call it a balance sheet risk management committee, which would be the ideal forum to debate this sort of thing, monitoring the, the, the key risk indicators, uh, making sure that the bank is remaining within recovery plan triggers, or otherwise recommending a revision of appetite levels, and then helping to keep ALCO informed so that it can inform uh, the board. So I think this is also an area of, for a technical ALCO, but of course not every bank has such a subcommittee. And then the medium term, what are the medium term takeaways from this? I think there's quite a few. From a Treasury and ALM perspective, there's quite a few takeaways in the medium term. First of all, I mentioned earlier, how did our risk management framework uh, respond to the crisis? How, how did it operate? Was it adaptable? Did it, did it enable speed of response? Did it respond to events and customer behavior in a way that was fit for purpose? So in other words, did we conclude, could do, can we conclude now at the end of 2020, that we have a satisfactory governance structure in place? And can we conclude that our set of key risk indicators for capital and liquidity is adequate? It tells us everything we need to know. Do we think it's suitable from an early warning perspective? Do we think it covers all the risks it does? This is a good time to review it. Other uh, medium term uh, response, of course, is this crisis, this stress event has lasted quite a long time. If you'd ask me personally, what's your ILAP outflow stress period, I would have said to you one year, which is at least one year, if not two. So when I'm doing my stress testing from a liquidity adequacy perspective for an ILAP, I want to look at at least 12 months of stressed cash outflows. If you'd asked me, how long do you think a stress event would last? I wouldn't have said a year, okay? But we've seen almost a year now, and it will be when we get to Q1 next year. So let's revise again what standalone self-sufficiency self -sufficiency we should have in the bank for a liquidity stress. OK, in previously, if you'd asked me, I would have said anything, uh, anything, say 30 days above 90, a pillar two minimum of 90 days for liquidity uh, with 30 days on top for my own benefit is a good number. 
120 days. So let's say I should be standalone self-sufficient for liquidity between 120 and 180 days. If you were to ask me that now, I'm wondering if we should be self-sufficient for funding uh, between 180 days and 365 days, because stress events could last a lot longer. Now in the Eurozone, there is quite a culture of business as usual funding coming from the central bank, but that's not the case in a number of other jurisdictions. So this, this, the answer to that question, the first bullet point there will be driven partly by your own jurisdictional culture. Okay, so that, and that, again, the other point I want to make on the medium term was uh, data analytics capability. Before I do, do we have that third bullet point there? Do we have what I consider smart treasury? In other words, an integrated dashboard that has all the relevant tier one or high level risk indicators on one dashboard that gives me up to the minute uh, real time liquidity, capital, etc. Uh, positions. If I don't have such an MI capability, management information capability, perhaps I should consider now, now implementing that. And slide 28 leads naturally onto slide 29 insofar as if necessary, as we look at the medium term, if we conclude that we do need to make changes, let's go ahead and make them, whether that's reviewing the risk management framework, modifying it, modifying our, our survival period time horizon. <clears throat> do we have, do we want to modify our approach to risk appetite? What I call the surplus surplus. How much of that do we want to have in place? Um, stress testing was our, is our stress testing framework fit for purpose? Does it still capture everything it needs to? And then finally, our data analytics capability. Do we think that is fit for purpose as well? Uh, it's it was always priority, but if you were to say, I mean, which bank doesn't have doesn't think oh we could have better IT suite and better technology capability? But something whether it's a smart treasury or using the same source of data, all from the same general, one general ledger, having an ability to know what the balance sheet exposure is at any time, up to the minute in real time, this sort of capability will really assist more effective risk management processes. So if that's, and that's definitely a medium term lesson learned, which we should consider as we come out of this crisis and what resource we want to deploy so we can improve our capability in that respect. Okay, and I've borrowed again from my friend Michael Eiko on slide here, mainly because I'm not so sure I can I completely agree with all of this. So if you look at uh, Michael's conclusions, the risk control framework, hypothetical framework pre-COVID compared to the post-COVID, I, I like this because it's a nice summary of all the issues. But again, I'm not sure that um, you know we the, the right hand side captures everything we need to. By the way, we, uh, I'm sure he's perfectly happy for me to disagree with him. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with the right hand side, but I'm wondering if it completely captures everything that I've discussed in this presentation. But it's a good checklist about what considerations we should have in the post COVID environment. Um, focus on, if you look on the right hand side, focus on strategic plans, on specific business lines, uh, bottom up as well as top down. Um, I think there's a good, there should be a good focus on it should be a renewed focus on reverse stress testing, but used as a genuine value add management information tool uh, by by having it as a more frequent process, making it iteratively less severe, seeing what that says, and then concluding what resource we, we can genuinely deploy. Uh, so I'd probably add that point to his checklist on the right hand side. Otherwise, this is a good uh, summary to, to be rounding up on. And then here are my conclusions. <laughs> Okay, uh, my conclusion is the coronavirus crisis has highlighted the fact that stress events will always occur with little prior warning and will not be like the last one. So there's a if we didn't know that already, then we certainly do now. The I think this crisis demonstrated the role that banks can play in supporting the customer franchise, which by definition means supporting the wider economy. So there's lots that a bank can do to support the customer franchise. And as soon as and from a treasury and ALM perspective, it's our objective to understand and be aware of what resources are available so we can recommend them to the board and the board can be available, uh, aware of it and then make the decisions accordingly. What, what, the, the three points in red are probably the, a nice place to finish up on. Post-crisis business as usual balance sheet risk management practice needs to reflect the potential longer term nature of future stress events. Yes, I was mentioning just now, how long do we think a stress event will last? Data analytics capability, I've already mentioned, very important. And then also at the end of the day, as like in any crisis, it's not always all doom and gloom. There is always some silver lining. Have we drawn any conclusions from our 
op our performance during the stress as a bank. What conclusions have we drawn about our performance, but also what can we take away as an opportunity? Is there a silver lining? Are there opportunities for us? With every change in operating model or stress event comes opportunities. And again, I mentioned about preserving the customer franchise and supporting the customer franchise. Personally, I think those banks that were seen to be carrying on doing business, including with new customers, will be the ones that will benefit in the post-crisis environment because they will be remembered. The ones that shut up shop to an extent will be remembered, but for the wrong reasons. And that's probably a nice place for me to finish. This time is different, uh, as they always say, but this time is insofar as banks aren't part of the problem, but at least they can be, uh, at least potentially, uh, and I have observed practically, part of, of the solution. Okay, thank you very much. And there is some relevant reading for you. I have got an appendix of management actions checklist. Uh, do have a look at that in your own time. And um, I, uh, I will conclude there. In fact, I probably want to go back to conclusions as I stop the share. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope I didn't speak too quickly um, and it was clear, my presentation was clear. Thank you very much again, uh, all of you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Murat. It was a, a really good uh, presentation. We actually have a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one is from Cristina Lancheros. Uh, it's most of the alcohol action you mentioned, basically liquidity risk mitigation, obviously have direct impact on NII. Uh, but not explicit action to mitigate NII risks were mentioned. You mentioned uh, IR hedges. So, something else you consider can be made on that side? Okay, should I, there's two points there, I think. Should I take the NII one? Yes, absolutely. That's a very good point that was raised by your, by your, by your delegate there. See, quite right. Every one of those actions are going to impact in some way on the PNL. And this is what I meant about Alco being aware of what that means and then deciding to what extent they want to do something. I mean, I always think at the end of the day, if one is um, carrying on doing business, then hopefully one is still carrying on generating PL. At the end of the day, we have the, the, no balance sheet is viable if I'm not doing that. So if there is a potentially ruinous impact on NII, or if I see my net interest margin eroding to the point where I'm no longer delivering value, then that's an action that I shouldn't be taking. Absolutely. But the, role, the importance of the ALCO is it's going to oversee or it should be overseeing that analysis. So it can inform the board or, or the EXCO uh, or both, of course, as to what any particular action means from a balance sheet perspective, impact on capital, impact on our resources being, being eroded and impact on PL. So certainly all the actions will have an impact on the NII. And if they are seen as too negative, then excuse me, ALCO is going to conclude that they're not viable. Now, if that means no longer supporting a particular type of customer or, or we're seeing too much credit exposure on this one, we draw back, we, we close the door on that, that customer base, then, then so be it. But the importance from an ALM process is that ALCO actually does this analysis and can present a, a solution or a range of solutions to the board. I hope that uh, has addressed that point. The second point was about, was it specific to do with interest rate risk in the banking book? Is that, is that what it was? Uh, yeah. The second one is like uh, something else you consider can be made on that side. Yes. Uh, with case. with yeah. the disappearance. Yeah. Now, with interest rate risk in the banking book, that's always, I've always, I personally have always been amused by that one because there's an accounting view of that and there's the practical view on that. I don't want to see, I mean, as, as, a, as a risk manager, I would probably quite like removing uncertainty by doing everything on a fixed rate basis, right? Because if I have a fixed cash flow, then whatever happens to rates, I'm good. But of course, from the bank's perspective and also the accounting perspective, an opportunity cost foregone, a change in rates impacts me from an accounting perspective in a negative way. So it's fixed rate risk that generates from a regulatory capital perspective, my, my interest rate risk in the banking book. So even before the crisis, I would have said, let's immunize, every, to use the fund manager's expression, let's immunize everything back to the overnight or quarterly. It, it's in, it, in sterling, it's going to be overnight now because we're replacing LIBOR with Sonia. Uh, US dollar LIBOR might not, might not disappear, by the way. Who knows? Who, who's taking bets on whether we still get US dollar LIBOR a year from now? <laughs> um, so um, that might not disappear because they put a delay on that. But in the sterling market, for example, or indeed in the, well, actually, I was about to say in the Eurozone, but of course, Euribor is not going away either. So you could carry on. Originally, we'd want to immunize everything back to a floating, floating three-month basis. By doing that, 
um, I don't, it doesn't bother me where um, rates go from a first order perspective. I mean, I might still have second order basis interest rate risk, interest rate risk exposure, but I should still immunize everything back to, let's say, three months floating, floating. If I do that, either naturally through an organic hedge or through a derivative market swap, then I'm covered off. This hasn't gone away in the, in the I don't think COVID-19 has had any impact on that. Uh, that would still be my policy going forward, immunize everything on a floating, floating basis, either three month or overnight. Um, but uh, the, 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 the focus, I think, of the regulator in most jurisdictions has been taken off that slightly because of the stress, because of COVID-19 stress event. But we can still, we will, it'll, it'll be back in focus next year. I, that doesn't change. That the policy doesn't change. We still look to either immunise um, back to floating or not originate it. I would also suggest that we should do this on a net basis. We should try and net off the fixed sides on both, and then just hedge the net. I think that we are having problems with your connection, Murat. Okay, let's give him a couple of minutes if he can rejoin uh, the meeting. Bueno, pues si, si os parece, lo dejamos aquí. Eh, la verdad es que ha sido un, una sesión muy interesante por, por parte de, de Murad eh, y lo que le pediría es que nos responda por escrito y lo haremos llegar a, a, a todo el mundo. Eh, bueno, pues eh, lo que vamos a hacer ahora, vamos a dejar un, un descanso de unos cinco minutos. Empezaremos ahí diez eh, con Alberto Ortega, ¿vale? Bueno, disculpad que parece ser que se ha conectado. Hello, Murat again. Can you hear us? Yes, my, my sincere apologies. We appear to have lost connection. It's, it's yeah. a crisis. It's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's the modern world. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, I did just finish the answer. My apologies. We lost connection. Um, so I think there's no impact from an IRRB perspective, from, uh, and um, that policy would be unchanged. Uh, it, that uh, it's not a, a primary driver of our LM response to this crisis. Uh, all right, um, and I think that we have uh, the last question. Um, this: What would be, from your point of view, a well-balanced wholesale retail funding ratio for a cre retail credit institution given the pan this pandemic context? What an excellent question! I love that. <laughs> I thought I thought your correspondent was going to say, "What do you think is an ideal HQLA portfolio size?" But <laughs> that's a really that's a broad question. If you look at an original text I wrote back from 2007, pre-crash, I would suggest that um, a, a good funding. Well, there's two things. If I don't have a reliance on it, if I've got a customer surplus funding base and I don't need any wholesale funding, then of course I would just do wholesale funding to diversify the funding base then to be honest, it doesn't matter what that amount of metric is. It, uh, to me, I don't, you know, I, I would have a limit so I don't have a concentration in it, you know, but 
whatever percentage of the overall funding base it wouldn't matter so much because I had an organic surplus customer funding base. On the other hand, if I had a loan deposit ratio that was below 100%, so I didn't have a surplus customer funding base, then I think about 20, let's say, I was going to say 20 to 30, so let's say 25%. 25% is a not bad ratio. If it's 10%, that's not bad either. If it got above that, I think if you don't have an organic surplus funding base, here in the UK, that would raise some eyebrows of the regulator. So I reckon 20 to 25% is probably a good ratio um, if you are not surplus customer funded. If you are surplus customer funded, at the end of the day, you, you could take what you like because you're not reliant on it. But this has implications for your FTP as well, by the way, because if I am surplus customer funded and drawing on wholesale funds, my FTP doesn't have to be the wholesale rate. Uh, whereas on the hand, if I'm short customer funded, then my marginal lending is based on my wholesale funding rate. So then it would. So um, I hope that's a good, that's an okay, acceptable answer. It's quite a broad ranging question. So uh, without knowing anything about the bank in question, I would say 20 to 25% sounds about right. Um, it is, I think that is all that we have, uh, Murad. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, okay. <laughs> sorry for the <laughs> so little glitch far. in the middle. Uh, sorry for the little so glitch far. in the middle. Uh, yeah, don't, don't worry at all. I think that uh, if we have any other question, uh, if you don't mind, we will send you an email with that. If you can answer it. By all means, with pleasure. I hope that's and been of interest. Be great to everyone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, that's, uh, I hope that's been of use to your delegates. Uh, if any of them has any questions of any kind arising, from the presentation or indeed just general, uh, do send them to me and I will answer them in detail and, and send that back to you. By all means, my pleasure to do that. <laughs> and well, thank you very much for being here, Murad. Uh, it's such a, a good pleasure. Uh, well, uh, and I think that that's all on, on my side. Okay, no, my um, pleasure. Thanks very I'm much. I'm to Spanish <laughs> now. <laughs> okay, leave the English and I will see you in my best wishes to all your delegates. All the best, Olmo. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.